Greetings, nerdlings. Today, we're going to be talking about the introduction to ecology and symbiotic relationships. So before we get started on this unit, I want you guys to take a second and read this little meme that I have up. It reads, this is the most dangerous animal in the world. It is responsible for millions of deaths every year. By its side, a great white shark swims peacefully. So think about what that means for a second, and we're going to discuss it later in class. So we share the earth with a lot of other creatures. We share it with other mammals, insects, plants. We don't really do a very good job of sharing it. We pollute the earth with fossil fuels that we burn in our cars, from factories. We have trash that we throw everywhere, our own waste. And it kind of hurts the environment. So as you can see over here, I have my little critters protesting. I have critters against litter. Litter hurts. We don't need your stinking trash. We don't dump trash where you live. And I'm bitter about litter. So what is ecology? It's the study of interactions between creatures and their environment. Because everything is connected to everything else. So we're going to start off by talking about the different types of relationships you find in ecological systems. So, relationships in ecological systems are called symbiosis. It's a relationship in which there is a close and permanent association between organisms of different species living together. So again, two species live together, and it includes different categories. These include parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. Mutualism is when both species benefit, and you usually represent this with a plus plus sign. So both benefit in mutualism. It's a mutual understanding that I'm going to get something good out of this relationship, and you're going to get something good out of this relationship. So for example, E. coli bacteria in our large intestine. Commensalism is when one species benefits and the other isn't affected. It's neither helped nor harmed. Kind of like a barnacle hitching a ride on a whale flipper. Doesn't really hurt the whale, but it benefits the barnacle. And then parasitism. This is when one species, the parasite, benefits and the other species, the host. So what is commensalism? This is a type of relationship, again, in which one species benefits and the other is neither harmed nor benefited. And we represent this by a positive neutral sign, or plus zero. So commensalism, that one species that receives the benefit from the other, it enhances the fitness of that species, and again, it does not help nor harm the other. So we have different types of fish hitching rides on manta rays that basically they don't have to worry or expend as much energy swimming. They kind of ride the current with that manta ray. In parasitism, one species feeds on another, and it enhances the fitness of the parasite, but it reduces the fitness of the host. So for example, a tick or a flea on a dog is going to decrease the fitness of the animal or the host while it's going to benefit. So again, we're going to represent that by a plus minus sign. So the parasite is going to get the plus because it's going to be benefiting and the host is going to get the negative sign. So this would be an example of a tapeworm that will latch on to your intestine and feed off of all of the nutrients you intake. Pretty nasty. In mutualism, both of those species are going to benefit. Two species provide resources or services to each other, and it enhances the fitness of both of those species. So for example, we have a hummingbird down here that's helping to pollinate different flowers, and in return, that hummingbird is getting food. So what is mutualism? It's a type of relationship, again, both of those species benefit, and we represent that by a plus plus sign. So one of the most common examples that you'll see is the clownfish and the sea anemone, Little Finding Nemo. So Little Finding Nemo over here 
is going to get benefited by this relationship by receiving protection from the sea anemone. The sea anemone is going to benefit from this relationship because the clownfish are very protective of them. They protect them from other predators that might damage them. And sometimes they also get leftover food pieces that they leave behind. Another type of relationship we're going to talk about is predation. This is when one organism seeks out and eats the other. Some predators eat meat and vegetables, and we call those omnivores, such as this bear over here. Bears will eat different types of plants, berries, and they also eat fish. Some are purely meat eaters, and we call those carnivores, such as sharks, lions, tigers, anything with sharp pointy teeth. In predation, that one species feeds on another, and it's going to enhance the fitness of the predator, and it will reduce the fitness of the prey. The prey is going to be the organism that gets eaten. And predators and prey are all found in the same ecosystem. So over here, our prey would be this poor little white furry bunny, and our predator would be the bobcat. Here we have our killer whale, which would be the predator, and it's about to, to specifically or on purpose beach itself over here so it can grab one of these seals, which will be the prey. In predator-prey relationships, it helps to control the population size. So if there are a few prey in the area, a small number of pred predators are going to be able to survive. Whereas if there is a large amount of prey, it's going to support a larger population of predators. So they basically fluctuate. When there's a lot of prey animals, the predator population starts to increase. As the prey uh, animals decrease, then the predators' numbers start to decrease. So if the predators rely on many sources of food, one disappearing may have little effect. So for example, if a cow goes extinct, we might have to eat more chicken, but the human race isn't going to die out. We would still survive. So predators can control the prey population. Predators help to control the prey population. So since there are a few predators of deer left, for example in New York, their population size is out of control. That's one of the reasons we have legalized deer hunts. We removed their natural predator, which was the gray wolf. And whenever we removed that natural predator, the deer population went unchecked and increased exponentially. So again, if there's no natural predators, the prey is going to become overpopulated. So here's an example of a predator-prey relationship. So for example, the moose would be the prey, and the predator would be the wolf. So over here, you see the moose population increases, the wolf population increases. As the moose population decreases, the wolf population decreases as well. So let's go back and start classifying or reviewing those different types of ecological interactions. So we have mutualism, that's a plus plus, because both of those organisms are going to benefit from that relationship. In commensalism, we have one organism that is going to benefit or get a plus, and another gets a zero because it's neither harmed nor helped. In predation, whether it's herbivory, meaning the plant is the prey, or whether it's carnivory, whether another animal is the prey, one, the predator, is going to receive a plus sign, while the prey is going to receive a minus sign. For competition, both of them are actually going to receive a minus sign. So for example, if there are two predators in the same ecosystem and they're both competing for the same food resource, both of those populations of predators will have a decrease in their fitness because they're both going to be competing for that same resource. So competition is a negative negative. Another negative positive would be parasitism. So the parasite is going to benefit or get that plus sign and the host is going to receive the negative sign. In competition, two species share a requirement for a limited resource. This reduces the fitness of one or both species. Most of the time it's going to reduce the fitness of both of those species and they'll both have a negative impact. 
So it's an interaction between organisms or species in which the fitness of one is lowered by the presence of the other. So these are both competing for a food source. Deer over here might be competing for a mate. Elephants might be competing with other species at a watering hole, or they might be competing with each other. But both of them are going to receive a negative sign because both of them are going to lose fitness. Since resources will eventually run out, organisms have to compete for them. This kind of plays back into the whole survival of the fittest when we learned about evolution in Darwin. It can be between members of the same species, like polar bears competing for fish, or it can be between members of different species. For example, a robin and a woodpecker might compete over a tree to build a nest in. Carrying capacity. This is the maximum number of individuals that an ecosystem can support. So once the carrying capacity is met, limiting factors such as space, food, and shelter are what keeps population sizes near their carrying capacity. So here's a graph demonstrating carrying capacity. So if left unchecked, we're going to have exponential growth. But eventually, those populations are going to level out because of those limiting factors. Just like on Earth, humans eventually are going to reach carrying capacity. The Earth is no longer going to be able to sustain the population of humans that is on it. We are going to be competing for food, for clean water, for places to live. So eventually we are going to reach carrying capacity just like other populations do as well. So this concludes our lecture over our symbiotic relationships as well as an introduction to ecology. I'll see you guys next time.